what you all came for, mostly. Um, Caitlin Good um, is the Urban Wildlife Program Manager for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Prior to coming to work with Georgia DNR, she worked as a bear biologist. Can you all hear me? For the Florida Fish and Wildlife for five years, and then she moved into um, the Hunting and Game Management Division, where she wrote hunting regulations for Florida's public lands. Caitlin received her bachelor's degree in environmental studies from Florida State University and her master's degree in wildlife management from the University of Tennessee. Her master's degree research was focused on population dynamics of a population of bears in Louisiana. Um, so without further ado, Caitlin, take it away. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, like Dara said, my name is Caitlin Goode. I'm the program manager for uh, DNR's Urban Wildlife Program. Um, I've, this is my first time to Bentry. I've lived in Georgia for about three years now. My husband's actually from Blairsville, so the mountains are not foreign to us. Um, but thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my program does, which is very much Atlanta-centric, um, but it is applicable statewide and to any um, any human wildlife conflicts that you guys are having um, and so we'll get started there's some videos hopefully they play um, but so this is um, where we cover we've got nine counties in the metro area um, going furthest north to, to Forsyth um, uh, which when my cousins live in uh, ball ground and it's amazing how far that little area has come since they moved there 20 years ago um, and you guys I'm sure are experiencing that here too um, and then, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so the program um, got started because there's a huge need for wildlife assistance in in urban areas um, where people that may may not be used to wildlife are interacting with it more often. There's more people and there's more wildlife living amongst each other having having issues. Um, and for the longest time, DNR didn't have anybody that was dedicated to the urban area of Atlanta. The closest person we had was two hours away on a wildlife management area planting dove fields. Um, and so anytime you know, a phone call happened, he would have to get off the tractor and get in the truck and get to Atlanta, which is always a nightmare uh, in and of itself. Um, and so this program got started to kind of improve our customer service um, to people in Atlanta. Uh, DNR's traditional customers, right, are hunters and anglers, um, but as, as um, we expand our reach, um, we're trying to uh, be a service, because we are a state agency, our purpose is to serve all of the citizens of Georgia, not just our traditional users, um, and so this was a, a, you know, a great step forward into doing that. Um, so um, basically, my whole program is trying to resolve human wildlife conflict, and there's two ways of doing that. There's reactive, right? There's a deer stuck on my wrought iron fence. I need help. Um, but then there's also the proactive side of it, trying to stop that before it starts, trying to stop bears from getting into trash cans before it starts, right? Um, and so there's two, two ways of doing that. And, and um, so we're trying to focus on both of those at the same time. Um, and it's, it's been fun. Um, the program started three years ago when I got here. So uh, we're still very, very new um, and still, still trying to find our footing, even though we've, we've done a, great, a lot so far. Um, so in the past, and this is since July 1, 2019, so not even three years yet, we've responded to over um, 5,300 calls in the metro Atlanta area. Um, a third of those would result in a site visit where one of my staff would actually go out and assist somebody on the ground versus over the telephone. Um, and then uh, the majority of these calls are related to deer and then coyotes or foxes. Um, Deer are our number one species that we get phone calls about, uh, believe it or not. Um, um, so I've used the word conflict. Um, uh, a lot of people use the word nuisance. Um, really, the overall term is human-wildlife interactions because interactions can be positive and negative. Um, when we talk about conflict, we're talking about negative interactions. 
Um, and that's for people and wildlife, right? The deer get, getting caught up on a wrought iron fence is probably a negative interaction for them as well. Um, and so uh, when I talk to people about conflict, there's a whole spectrum of it. For some people, simply seeing a coyote in their backyard is a conflict for them. And, and that's fine. If that's where you are, that's fine. We can work with you on that. Um, our job is to give you the tools to see as little or as much wildlife as you want with the, you know, the sideboards of they're still going to be there. <laughs> they're going to exist, right? So, but we can help you reduce the amount that you see them or increase the amount that you see them um, that's, you know, reasonable as well. Um, so again, uh, like I said, deer, coyotes, um, and then uh, foxes, raccoons, uh, birds, birds of prey are a huge, right now, a huge um, call volume for us. Um, and when the, the seasons or the time change happens in the fall, when we fall back, we see a spike in owl calls um, because uh, they're not used to us being on the roads at the same time they are. Um, and then most of the calls that we get are about sick, injured, or orphaned animals or just sightings. Um, so those are our two big categories. Um, so I'm going to talk about our common species. Um, and I know you guys are have a really good base for, for a wildlife knowledge here. That's why you're here on this committee. Um, but the first one I'll talk about is raccoons. And, and I'm going to go through some basics about all of these because it's really important when we start talking about conflict. Raccoons are omnivores. They eat everything, um, pretty much. Um, they breed from December to June, so they have a long breeding season, but it peaks around this time, March. Um, and then they'll have kits um, about in about two months. And then they will uh, stay with the female for a year. Um, so they only have one litter annually, um, and that litter size changes on how healthy they are, right? The better... Um, shape mom's in, the more kits she can have and keep alive. Um, normal behavior, yes, they're mostly nocturnal, um, but if, and this is maybe not so applicable to y'all as it is to our urban, our urban folks, but like the subdivision's nice and quiet during the day, right? Because everybody's at work and school. It's a great time for a raccoon to come out and raid a trash can. Doesn't mean they're rabbit. So, so those are the same conversations we typically have over and over again. Yes, normally they are nocturnal. It doesn't mean they can't adapt and change their behavior based on what we're doing. All right, so bats. We've got 16 species of bats in Georgia. Um, they're all insectivores, so all they eat are insects. They're wonderful. They do a wonderful service for us, and we appreciate them. Um, perhaps not in our house but we appreciate when they're outside. Um, and so life cycle, um, they breed in the fall, um, and then they, their maternity season is starting next month. Um, so from April to July, bats are protected um, from removal, from home removal, because their pups are flightless. So if you have, now is a great time to actually check, make sure you don't have any bats in your attic, um, because nuisance wildlife control operators are not allowed to come in between April and June and remove them unless there's a human health issue. And by human health issue, I mean the FedEx shipping center in Atlanta that had guano dripping down onto the packages that they were sorting through. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I feel too. Um, <laughs> I, I learned a really valuable lesson that I'm um, very allergic to guano. I had a nice asthma attack the first time I did a bat call when I was here in Georgia. Um, had never done bat work before, um, so now I look like a really big nerd with my huge face mask and I glove up real big because I will absolutely, like, you'll have to take me to the hospital. <laughs> um, but normal behavior, um, they are most active in the evening and early morning hours when their food is active, right? Um, and then um, they do um, hibernate here. They roost um, up in trees um, or caves, lots of cave bats up, up this on this part of the world. Um, and uh, like I said, their, their maternity season is from April to July. By the end of July, all of their pups should be able to fly. So doing exclusions is not a big deal. Geese. Um, I know you guys are familiar with those. Um, so uh, their life cycle, um, they're, it's what we call pair bonded. Um, so lots of people like to think of it as mating for life. 
it's not as um, emotionally taxing on them as that is for us. Um, uh, so, so that to say, if one of them dies, they'll they'll find another one because their goal in life is to have as many babies as possible and to survive as long as possible. And you need a partner. Geese need partners to do that. Um, breeding happens right now, um, and this will all all come together. Um, all of this right now breeding that's happening, um, and uh, they will hatch, um, takes 28 days for them to hatch, and then you'll start seeing the goslings around for a while um, until they're able to fly. What's really important is geese molt once a year in the month of June, which means they become flightless and they become a pain because they can't go anywhere. Wherever they are, that's where they are for that whole month until those flight feathers come back. Um, and they are most active at daytime. They can be super uh, protective of their nests. My husband, um, Worked in Chicago. My, he's also a wildlife biologist. Um, so between the two of us, we have some really good stories. Um, <laughs> but he was working in Chicago, and he was doing some goose work. And like they had one person that had a backpack that was like basically a shield, while the other person did the egg oddling, uh, addling. And uh, and so you know he was getting attacked by geese regularly. <laughs> uh, Can y'all hear in the back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, some, some. Sure. Why are geese protected from shooting them if you are allowed to have a season for ducks? They, they, we have a season on geese as well. Um, yep, yep. I can't give you the dates off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it starts in September. It's a long season, um, so you can hunt geese in the state of Georgia. This is, you know, everybody's favorite um, controversial critter, the coyote, um, and and it's either a love. Uh, or a hate relationship, typically. There's very few people that just could care less that coyotes exist. Um, some people are really, really excited to see them, think they're awesome. Um, and then the other extreme is that they're the only good coyote is a dead coyote. So wherever you fall on the spectrum, that's fine. Um, uh, but they are omnivores. Um, their main prey species is going to be small rodents, uh, so small mammals, mice, um, maybe a squirrel, uh, not very many. Um, Unfortunately, I told I, I typically say out loud to the coyotes because they can understand me is if they would just eat the armadillos, they would find a place in Georgia and warm up to everybody's hearts. Um, unfortunately, they don't understand that, you know, armadillos and uh, other things are not the same. Um, but they are breeding right now. Um, they're, they will uh, give birth about a den um, to five to seven pups, again, depending on mom's condition. Um, and their pups will stay with them. Um, they are solitary hunters, uh, but they do hang out in loose family groups. So um, if you hear yipping and, and it sounds like one's going crazy and then the other ones talk to each other, they're all reporting on their nightly activities. I got something over here, and if it's big enough to share, they'll share it. Um, and, uh, but they're not, they're not pack hunters. Um, so that's a really important note um, because people, when they hear them calling back and forth to, to each other, it really freaks people out if they're not used to hearing that noise. And it, it freaked my dog out the first time he had heard it. He had never been around coyotes before. And he, his face was priceless. It was like those big eyes and the head tilt. And <laughs> he's an 80 pound dog, so there's not much that scared him. Um, but that, was, that freaked him out. They are most active at, um, or they're crepuscular, so dawn and dusk. They're really, they can be very night active. But again, um, if all is quiet in the neighborhood during the day, there's nothing to stop them from coming out um, and, and taking care of what they need to take care of. Um, bears, oh no, my picture didn't show up. Hmm. That's okay. You guys know what they look like, right? <laughs> um, so so um, omnivores, obviously, they eat everything. 80% um, of their diet is plant-based. Um, so when I was in Florida, that was a really big point of emphasis when I was doing bear presentations regularly it, because, they, yes, they're big and they're, they have large teeth, but they could, if, you know, if you could give them acorns, they would be happy. That's, that's about all they need. And some berries. Um, they breed in the summer months, June and July. Um, uh, 
the yearlings stay with mom for a year and a half, or the cubs of the year stay with mom for a year and a half, and they get kicked out in June, which is when um, your bears are nice enough to travel to Atlanta um, and end up in Sandy Springs at 75 285 interchange. We greatly appreciate that. Um, <sighs> yeah, we had one that, oh my goodness, this poor bear. Well, it was very impressive. Uh, it was little, little bear. Um, I mean, maybe 60 pounds. He was this tiny yearling. Um, and it's the same time as the Sandy Springs bear, if you followed that one. Um, but he made his way all the way from Top Golf in Alpharetta. Um, he followed this power line straight into um, this industrial park in Gwinnett County, like, I mean, just on the other side of Atlanta, and then made it out to Jackson County. Um, so it was amazing to watch him uh, travel. And, and this isn't relevant for you guys as much as it is for our Atlanta folks that freak out um, when the bears are there. And I understand, right? Like you're going out, you live in, uh, you know, Buckhead and there's a bear in your backyard. That's a little different than here. Um, but uh, you, we really do try and let them travel because they are on a mission to get somewhere um, for the most part. And, and, and it's to establish their own home range and, and move. And uh, that's mostly males. I didn't get hands on that one, um, so I don't know that it's a male, but the Sandy Springs one was a male. Um, and so there's just these males trying to push out and find their own space, and they get caught up in um, <laughs> Atlanta traffic. Um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help that one. Um, uh, but uh, we try and let them move as much as they can. That Sandy Springs bear had a nice little honey hole of trash right where we found him behind the Sandy Springs Fire Department who, ironically enough, got all the credit for trapping the bear and moving it, um, and we, we assisted. I was like, really? <laughs> I for sure fired the dart gun. <laughs> um, but that's fine. I don't need the credit. Um, so bears' normal acti activity, they're most active at dawn and dusk. They're crepuscular. Um, they will, um, they den up, right? They're denning right now. They're having cubs. Um, uh, the bear biologist last week went out and had a female that had three cubs and was nice enough to send me pictures. Um, it didn't make me jealous at all. Um, um, and then, um, again, they can easily habituate to human environments, right? You guys know that. Um, so deer, everybody's other favorite critter. Um, again, this love-hate relationship. Um, so they are herbivores, so they are a completely plant-based diet. Um, and uh, that is not just native plants. As you guys know, your landscaping is extremely high in calories for them um, and tastes really, really good. Um, and so that is, that's an easy, high uh, calorie food source for them. Um, they breed October to January. We call that the rut. Um, uh, fawns are born May to August. It's peak in June. Um, and you'll see that in a second. Um, and they spend, um, does spend a little amount of time with fawns the first month. Um, they are not abandoning their fawns. The only thing that abandons their children is us. Deer don't do that. <laughs> um, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, as much as we want to, right, sometimes. Um, and they are most active at dawn and dusk, right? We, we see that with, um, again, the time change, the shorter days. Um, we see them a lot more frequently because there's less less time for them to be out when we're not out. All right, foxes. So we have two species of foxes here, gray foxes and red foxes, and they're fairly similar as far as life cycle goes. Um, gray foxes are native. Um, red foxes were actually introduced when Europeans um, came over, uh, but they're naturalized, so we consider them a, a naturalized species, um, have a hunting season on them as well. Um, but they're mostly small mammals, um, birds, uh, insects. Um, they breed January through April um, and have their, uh, their kits in the, uh, their den. Um, and, and they become sexually mature at one, so they can reproduce really early in their life cycle. Um, normal behavior, gray foxes can actually climb trees, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, they have a little bit of a smaller home range than our red foxes. Um, so if you see them, you'll probably see them regularly. It's probably the same one. Um, and both of these can easily habituate to human environments. Um, the, the, like I said, their food source is rodents, right? And people are really good at creating 
garbage that brings in rodents or, you know, hay or whatever that brings in that prey species so they can adapt to us very easily. Snakes. Yes. <laughs> Yay. Um, we have 46 species of snakes in Georgia. Six are venomous. Um, only two live here, possibly three on the, up this air, in this um, area. Pygmy rattlesnakes don't quite get up here, um, but it doesn't say that you might not see them because you guys are right on the edge of their range. Um, but copperheads and timber rattlesnakes are the, the most common. Um, and a really important um, point is that reptiles are ectothermic, which means they depend on the external temperature for energy. Um, and I had to explain this to a Fulton County Sheriff's officer at 3 a.m. Um, when he was freaking out because a homeless woman apparently had a rattlesnake in a box and he would not go look at it. And this was the when we had this, what well, we, down south, <laughs> Atlanta people had the snow. Um, this past year in January, uh, Martin Luther King weekend. And I was like, dude, it's, it's 15 degrees outside in Atlanta right now. I was like, I promise that that snake's not going to move if you look in the box. Um, <laughs> I was like, is this? Uh, he had to call a sergeant to confirm. Um, I was just like, all right, like, look, I was, I was in Florida. I was very happy because uh, I was in Georgia. And I had my daughter with me. She's turning three. Um, and we were sharing a bed at my parents' condo, and uh, I was like, dude, if you call me again, <laughs> I, like, I need you to really need me, because if you wake this two-year-old up in the middle of the night, she's not going back to sleep. Um, but anyway, uh, so they're ectothermic. Right now, um, you probably are going to see them moving a little bit because it's starting to get sunny, um, and copperheads in particular are wonderful at blending in with their surroundings in this type of um, the leaf environment. I, we were moving limbs yesterday, and I was like, we're going to see a snake today. <laughs> Just like pulling the limbs and my flip-flops going, hmm. I'm like, this is a poor life decision. Um, but <laughs> go ahead. Um, so a little bit of a quiz. Uh, copperheads? Neither. I tricked you guys. Um, these are both banded water snakes. Uh, you can go to the next one. All right, one more time. This isn't a trick. Yes, yes. Um, and it's juvenile, right? It's still the little green tail. Um, but copperheads have really distinctive what we call um, saddlebags. So if you've ridden a horse, you know, like the saddlebags that sit behind you. Um, you can see hourglass shape on the back. I like the saddlebags because that's, for me, that's a better um, description uh, and sticks with me. Um, but but yep, so non-venomous snakes will look like venomous snakes. It's a strategic, um, you know, uh, evolutionary choice for them, um, having the fake uh, venom pits and the, the smaller eyes. Um, uh, so it helps them look like a venomous snake to things that might want to eat them um, and, and helps protect them from predators. So. All right, so why did I talk about life cycle over and over and over again? Because when it comes to conflict, um, that's when we see it. Um, baby making season, baby rearing season, and then that's uh, deer. If you want to go to the next one, this is uh, really, um, you can see the deer fawn calls peak, um, and then the rut peaks um, for as far as phone calls go. And my husband is a deer biologist for the state, um, got his master's degree doing deer stuff. And I was like, look at this cool chart I made for my PowerPoints. And he goes, why are there no fawn calls in January through June? And I will forever tell this story because I just looked at him and I was like, I don't know, Matt. Why aren't there any fawn calls? And I, like, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, but yeah, because there are none, right? Like You can see when they lose their spots, <laughs> when they drop and when they lose their spots. Um, and it's just, it's such, it's such a visual, like, we get phone calls when things are having babies or making babies or having babies um, because they're just so active. Like coyotes, you think about ha them having pups. Mom and dad are going back and forth from the den to getting food. You see them all the time when, when I see, you can tell when pup season is because we just, our phone calls are off the charts. I saw a coyote. I never seen one before. I was like, well, it's been there. Um, just goes through my yard every afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever stayed up with a newborn? 
<laughs> every two hours. <laughs> um, so, so you know, ha that's it's very important when we're talking about conflict. Is what time of year is it? Because that's when you're going to have the conflict is during these two seasons for sure. So um, when we talk about conflict, there's three things that wildlife need, and they're the same three things that we need. It's food, water, and shelter. So wildlife does not want to hang out with you. They don't want to be your friend. doesn't want to share space with you any more than it absolutely has to. You have something that they need to survive, and that's food, water, or shelter. One of those three things is why that animal is in your backyard. Um, again, like we, we had somebody call and said, there was a bunny looking at me. I was like, <laughs> I can't, I can't help that. <laughs> zero, zero, zero percent that I can help about that. Um, so that, I don't, I guess that's not a conflict, but, um, but, you know, the bunny was eating his landscaping and he came out and was yelling at the bunny and the bunny looked at him and, well, you know, you have food. Um, but anyway, so when we talk about conflict or we talk about wildlife being around, it's for one of these three things. It doesn't matter what animal it is. It's one of these three things. Um, and so when you figure out the animal, you figure out what they eat, right? Omnivore, herbivore, what their main prey species is. Um, you know, water sources are very, fairly easy to identify. Um, and then um, shelter, what time of year is it? Do they have a den underneath somewhere that is making them, or do you have logs and stuff in your backyard, a brush pile to make really good shelter for them? Um, so those are things that you need to think about when, if you're having an issue with a specific animal. So we'll kind of go through some of it. <clears throat> um, so I give this PowerPoint at our um, Law Enforcement Academy also um, because training them is just as important as um, training ourselves uh, because they talk to the public just as much as we do. Um, and so you Wildlife Biology 101, um, a lot of times you can just explain to somebody what's happening. The coyotes are trying to rear pups right now. That's why they're so active. Um, that sense of knowledge um, reduces the fear because a lot of the fear associated with wildlife is just a lack of knowledge. Um, and so just giving that little bit of education can go a long way. Um, next one. But some things are a little bit more complicated. Um, bears and subdivisions. Uh, bears at the I-75-285 interchange. I was just sitting there watching that bear move around. Um, I was in Sandy Springs and getting phone calls and putting them, trying to catch up with this bear. Uh, and I was just like, I swear, if this bear gets inside the perimeter, <laughs> like, people are going to lose their minds even more than they already have. Um, raccoons on porches, uh, bats in the attic. Um, so those are a little bit more complicated because they're a little bit scarier for people, right? Um, that's like a space invader type of situation um, when there's something in your house, right? And it also, um, just, you're good, you're good. It also requires people to take some type of action on their part, right? And we know that motivating people is the easiest thing ever. Um, <laughs> changing human behavior is, <laughs> is it, it's easier to change wildlife behavior than human behavior. Um, but food attractants, the big three, garbage, pet food, bird seed, you guys know all of this. Um, and this, bear, this uh, bird feeder is bear resistant. This is like a design that we would recommend to people. Um, what this person did, though, um, in their effort to change, and we appreciate that, um, is they hung the bird feeder right above the pole, which is right here. Um, and so bears are habitual. You all know that, right? So he's like, well, the bird feeder was here. Like, oh, it's just up a little bit higher than where it used to be. Um, and so it's so like an A for effort situation. That bear did get that, to that bird feeder um, and was rewarded for his trapeze skills. Um, <laughs> And then pet food. Pet food's bad for a couple of reasons. One, if you have a dog, um, they're a little bit protective, right? That's their food. That is not anybody else's food. Um, and so that can cause situations with deer, raccoons, bears, uh, foxes, coyotes, anything that would eat that food in addition um, to the dog or cat, um, it can cause issues. Um, other things, um, gardens, landscaping, livestock, compost piles that aren't properly maintained. Um, does anybody want to take a guess what killed the sheep? Is it, I, I tricked you guys again. I apologize. But um, this was actually a cat, uh, so a mountain lion. And we have this really cool um, diagnostic chart um, 
but cats cats do the throat first, um, and then they immediately start to eat the rib cages. Coyotes will go for the um, entrails first, so the guts. Um, that's the first thing that they eat. If it was a bear, it would be like a murder scene, because uh, bears are very very bad at killing things. Um, like you know, this is the conversations that happen at our lunchroom is. What wildlife species would you want to die from? <laughs> uh, and mine is for sure a big cat. It's quick. It's over. You don't even know what happened. Um, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but if you want to go to the next, yeah, you can. Um, so this is our, our diagnostic chart um, that the state of Washington did for themselves, but is really nice because it applies to our states too. You just take out grizzly bear and cougar and wolf, um, hopefully, um, and then we can we can diagnose the depredation. Uh, and so um, it's it, a little bit of CSI when you do livestock. I had to do a bunch of them in Florida for bears, uh, but livestock depredation stuff. Um, so it's it flexes your brain a little bit. Um, from getting outside of your normal management stuff that you do. But. That's how you tell what killed something. Mm -hmm. So, so um, another thing to think about, and I've already said it, is rodents, right? These are um, a big prey species for foxes and coyotes. Um, and so if you have something that's attracting rodents to your backyard, it's going to attract the things that eat the rodents, right? Um, well, a biologist that I used to work for in Florida used to say he had a squirrel or he had a hawk feeder because he had his bird feeder out that the squirrels would get on and he just had a pair of hawks that would just come and nail them. Um, so it was a hawk feeder. Uh, <laughs> um, but but these this is this is a great um, public service when they eat what they're supposed to be eating, right? Rodents and they don't venture off into something else. Um, that's great. Uh, and then natural food sources, um, and, and I'm sure that you guys experience that here. Uh, where I lived in Florida was in the Panhandle. Has anybody been to St. George Island, Cape San Blas area? Yes, that's where I used to live. There's bears there. Um, we had a bear on the island while I was there uh, and on the Cape. Um, but we have, um, if you ever drive by, down 98, there's all of those sand oaks right there. And bears from the National Forest actually migrate down to those, those oak trees because they're so um, acorn heavy. They just produce every year. Um, and it's just, we had some bears that were collared and you could just see them. They're up in the woods, woods, uh, and then the swamp really. And then they migrate down to the coast and in the fall during when the acorns start coming on. Um, and then they go back, um, hopefully. Uh, but then fruits, berries, um, and then insects, and then dead things, right? Um, again, this is another bless your heart phone calls, woman was upset because there were vultures in her backyard eating a dead squirrel. I was like, well, it'll only take them a little bit and they'll be gone. Um, some of my answers are not appreciated um, the way that they should be. Um, I promise my customer service skills are much better than that. Um, it's a little gentler, but it is kind of like a, well, yeah. Do you want the dead squirrel in your backyard? <laughs> um, but, yep. So, um, Oh, yeah. So here, this is a good example, and I won't make you guys guess it. This is a bear. This is I, actually uh, in Port St. Joe. I took that picture in Florida for those that are familiar with the area. Um, that bear was up in the tree just breaking branches and ripping acorns off. Um, and somebody called in, like, freaking out. So there's a bear making a nest in my oak tree. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they don't, they don't do that. Um, and then on the flip side, we have people that are like horrified that the bears up there breaking limbs um, on their beautiful manicured oak trees. And I'm like, they're pruning it? I don't, like, <laughs> I, like I can't, I, honestly, I can't help you. I had to go out to a state senator's house in Florida who had just his whole, like, just his driveway lined with beautiful oak trees. And the, this bear was like a half a mile away from his house. He had a very long driveway as a female with cubs, and he's like, they're in my oak trees. I'm like, but they're like all the way over there. They're not even by your house. Um, and so, you know, that, that situation's always fun when you to talk to a state senator down from, you know, the bears are not a threat. Um, but, uh, and then water. Um, hopefully y'all don't have alligators up here. Don't call me if you do. Um, region one, game management. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, but water is a really good attractant too. Um, bird, bird, uh, bird baths, pools, um, uh, koi ponds. I apologize if a raccoon finds your koi pond, you will not have koi in the next morning. Um, and then ducks, ducklings in, in, in pools. We get lots of phone calls about that in the summertime. Um, and then shelter. Um, and this is one that a lot of people don't really think about um, until it happens, right? Um, bats in the attic, um, fawns. We, our, our state deer biologist, Charlie, um, has a doe that drops a fawn in his backyard every year um, because it's a fenced in yard. And she knows that there's no predators in there. So she hops the fence, drops her fawn, and hops back out and knows that that fawn's not going to be messed with. Um, and so that's, that's a strategic move on her part. And it's very strategic in, in Atlanta. We have lots of does that do that. Um, uh, this fox on the bottom left was, um, he was denning underneath a driveway that was about to get resurfaced. Um, and fear not, coyotes and foxes typically have multiple dens that they can like back up plans, plan B, C, and D. If one den gets destroyed, they can move their pups or kits to another one. Um, so what we did in that situation was um, threw some mothballs down in that den hole, and that uh, fox moved and found, you know, moved its kits to a different spot. Um, same with that coyote there. Um, that was that was the last bear, Florida bear that I touched. Um, that was a 500-pound bear that decided to take a nap underneath the trailer. Um, yeah, it was not on getting it out or crawling under there. Um, I realized the fear that I didn't have. Um, <laughs> like, this is what nightmares are made of. Um, but uh, he, there was something wrong with him, so we ended up having to euthanize him. But, uh, but again, like those are things that a lot of people at crawl spaces are really welcoming. Yes, ma'am. Calls on turkey. Oh yes, um, it is uh, very bizarre um, to me because they're turkeys, right? Um, but Cobb County, for whatever reason, has some very violent turkeys. Um, like they are aggressive. Um, and I don't know what their attitude issue over is over there, but the, the, the turkeys in Cobb County have an attitude problem. But, but the problem with turkeys is once they've decided that they're the dominant bird, there's no changing their mind. They're, they're it. Um, we had a woman that got spurred by a, a turkey. Yeah. And then it wouldn't let her out of her house. Uh, like... You know, like, ah, turkey season's almost here. I was like, hold on, two more weeks, and you can take care of it yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. Come up our just feel like they own the Oh, yeah, yep. Um, and we'll talk, about, we'll talk about some of those uh, strategies for dealing with um, wildlife that have, have an attitude problem, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, you can go, yeah. Um, so resolving conflict, um, removing attractants, securing them in some way, um, picking up the pet food when you're done with it, and actually that raccoon's in the water bowl. Um, so again, water um, as a uh, an attractant. Uh, we're putting up exclusions on our blueberry bushes because the deer are already hitting them. Um, they're baby blueberry bushes, and Maggie's obsessed with them, um, so we have to save them, uh, and then. Deterrence, if you want to flip to the next, sorry. I feel like naked without my clicker. Um, <laughs> um, so that, the water scarecrow right there, um, the stick with the yellow on it is my favorite thing. Um, it is a motion activated sprinkler and it sprays sporadically. So there's no pattern to it whatsoever. Um, and it is a heavy stream. Um, I still have not gotten the photo of my employee getting sprayed by one. He, he had he just planted fresh landscaping, and of course the deer were on it immediately. And so I was like, "Take this home with a game camera, and we can get some pictures of the the deer getting sprayed. It'll be great for a PowerPoint." Well, the first picture is Kevin going like this because he <laughs> still don't have it. Uh, before he retires, I will get my hands on that photo. Um, but that's really great for wildlife that has a, um, a set route. Um, so if you have a string of turkeys that walks the same path every day to your yard, putting that in their path so they get sprayed, it might not deter them completely, but it's at least going to break up that path. Um, it works really well for deer and bears because they are habitual walkers. They walk the same trails. You put it on their trail and they move their trail. Um, so they'll still be around, but it's at least the, they have not beaten a path through your backyard. 
Um, coyote silhouettes work, um, but you do have to move them regularly. So anything that um, is a deterrent, you need to do on a regular basis and change it up so that the wildlife doesn't get used to it. Um, Malorganite is pretty much the only thing that I recommend as far as um, deterring deer or applying something to your landscaping um, to deter deer. Um, we put this on our hostas annually. Um, sometimes they still get um, hit, but you do have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines as far as like when to put it out. Um, but there, it is it is successful. Um, it is a fertilizer made from human waste, so maybe don't put it on your garden if you're going to eat those. <laughs> um, but it does work really well. And the person that came up with this idea to produce food fertilizer, sell people back their own poop, it's genius. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. And then exclusions. Um, so putting up hardware cloth on your gable vents, make sure bats can't get in. Um, Wiring for geese. Um, geese have to land on water to walk up on land. They can't land on land. Um, so if you have an issue with geese coming up in a certain area, putting up some fencing or some netting so that they can't get up. There were some um, really um, thick landscaping around the water's edge. Really good options um, because they can't get past it uh, up onto the water. Um, and then my favorite is electric fencing for all of the things. Everything hates electricity. Um, and I know that that is not a, a favorite of everybody. I see, I see people shaking their heads. Um, but it is, it's my favorite thing. Um, and then wait it out, right? There's a seasonality to conflict. I showed you that already. Um, you wait till the geese put their flight feathers on and then scare them off so they fly away. Um, birds of prey are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, and so if you have a hawk that's made a nest in an unfortunate spot, um, like your house right above your door, um, and has laid eggs, you're stuck with that hawk as your neighbor uh, until those eggs hatch and those uh, chicks fledge. So um, something to keep in mind. Uh, and then like bat maternity season, um, it'll be over soon uh, type of thing. And then removal. Um, you guys are absolutely within your rights to hire a nuisance wildlife control operator to remove unwanted wildlife that they're allowed to remove. Deer, bears, turkeys, sorry, um, they're not allowed to do. Um, in his yeah. mouth? Yes, that's a cat in his mouth. Aww. So yes, that happens, right? We all know that. Um, not as frequently as people think that it does. Um, cats are probably more likely to be taken by an owl than a coyote. Um, uh, so don't always blame the coyote just because you saw it and then the cat was gone. Um, not to say that they don't do it. But my point in this slide is um, I would rather have this coyote that's eating the mice and voles, right, than the, what I will deem as a serial pet killer. Um, <laughs> and, and so if you know that this coyote is doing bad things, absolutely trap and remove it. But if you just know that there's a coyote in the area and it's really not doing anything, that's maybe not a coyote that you want to trap and remove because you don't know what coyote is going to come next. There's always going to be another one. Um, and it might be the serial pet killer from down the street. Um, so you want to be you know, strategic about what animals you remove because nature doesn't like a vacuum, right? Um, if you take an animal out, another animal is just going to fill its space if those attractants are there. Um, and then we can't relocate carnivores. So anything raccoon, uh, bobcat, skunk, trapped has to be euthanized because they're a rabies vector species. Um, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind, too, that nucos aren't taking them to some magical place somewhere else. <laughs> All right, yeah, rabies vector, yeah. Okay, so um, why can't we relocate things? Um, because you guys don't want the Atlanta bear that I trapped and put up here, right? <laughs> we took that bear to Cahutta on the Tennessee line and pointed him north, I promise. <laughs> um, we have an agreement, uh, the southeastern states have an agreement with each other that, that we won't relocate um, bears to other states, right? So that's why we go to the state line <laughs> and turn them <laughs> Um, it's Tennessee's problem now. Uh, but they come back, right? Um, and these are all of the, those are the three bear populations we have in Georgia. And those, those black dots are all the, the bears sightings um, at circa this map um, uh, where we've had bears. So they move, right? They're good travelers. Deer are really good travelers. Um, so we try not to trap 
and, and do anything with them if we don't have to. Um, and this was a, an example from Vermont um, of a bear that they trapped and moved um, and it going back. It had to cross three interstates to get back to its home range and it did. And so that's not only dangerous for the bear, right? Um, but it's also dangerous for the people driving on the interstate that may not want to hit a 300 pound solid block. Um, and so that's some, you know, some considerations when we make decisions to do thing, things like that. Um, so something that I want to point out again is wildlife are naturally fearful of us. It is an evolutionary instinct for them to be afraid of us, right? Um, for the longest time, we were the apex predator. That's probably shifted a little bit as we've retreated into our homes, right? Um, but we still have that dominance um, that uh, can be displayed, and it should be displayed on a regular basis to keep wildlife afraid. Um, um, so what I like to tell people is continued exposure to people with no negative consequences is going to make them not care that you're out on your porch um, doing something or grilling, you know, uh, or we had a video of somebody in Florida that was just sitting there texting on their phone and looked up and there's a bear right there, like right in her face. Um, and so she was smart enough to not move and text her son, who's huge, um, and he just slowly walked out and the bear turned around and walked off and like, yeah, you know, again, apex predators, right, on our phone. Um, <laughs> but we don't want wildlife that that is that, um, you know, used to, comfortable, yeah, good word, um, habituated to people. Um, doesn't matter what species it is. We have more deer that attack people in Atlanta than anything else um, because people think it's cool to feed a deer out of your hand and then are surprised um, when they get kicked. And I don't have a good answer for those. Um, but we have deer that have lost their fear uh, or have yeah, lost their fear of dogs um, that will stomp a dog if during fawning season. So many dogs. Um, and so these are some of the things that we try and teach people to do before it gets that bad, right? We want to keep that natural fear intact. Um, so if you'll play the middle um, video, the, yeah, the, yep. So this is Miss Nishanto. Oh, good. It's going to be loud, so brace yourselves. Uh, let me go in your office because he might come after me. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so if Miss Nishanto can do it, you can do it. Um, you remember that. Uh, I will point out that she had a grill and a bird feeder on her porch, so we're all shocked that there was a bear there. Um, but it's a really great example of human dominance. Um, and if you'll do the one on the right, this is Colorado, a dump out in Colorado. Um, and these are some, um, I don't think that they're game wardens, but they're officers that have been trained in hazing. So, so watch, watch the bear. He stops and turns around. Do I really have to leave? Yes, yes you do. So, so for some bears that are, are or some animals, <laughs> it'll, it, it's almost over. There it is. Okay, sorry. Um, for some wildlife, it doesn't insert critter, right? I'm obviously I've. <laughs> 10 years of experience doing bear things, so like my catalog of bear videos is long. Um, but insert critter, um, if they've gotten used to a food source, a dump, right, there's multiple dumpsters there um, that that bear is used to coming and getting, uh, it's going to take a lot more to get them to move off of that food source. And that bear will probably come back, but what he's not going to do is hang around when a car pulls up. Now, the bears in Louisiana got smart enough that they recognized what color the game warden's trucks were. <laughs> um, and so if a game warden pulled up, they ran away. If it was anybody else, they would just stay. Uh, so it's just like we will be overrun by bears at some point. They're too smart for us. Um, but noisemakers, passive deterrents like that water scarecrow are excellent. Um, my favorite is paintball gun um, because it can be used on multiple things. You don't actually have to hit them to get them to move. You can hit the ground in front of them and that's pretty much enough. Um, but the important thing that you do if you employ any of these is associate it with your voice. Is your, I had a, In Florida we had bears all the time in our backyard. I had a paintball gun by the back door because I was not going to be the bear biologist that had bear shoes. Um, 
And, uh, and so I made sure that any bear that came into our backyard ran off, but you have to yell at them at the same time. Get out of here, bear, da da as you're shooting the paintball gun. Doesn't, you don't have to hit them if you don't want to. Um, paintball guns work really well on deer, too. Um, so, yes. It's important uh, for people who have recently moved into this community to know that uh, big tree bears know how to roll with cargo. Yes. 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 So don't, leave, don't leave chewing gum and deodorant and stuff. Like Smelly things in vehicles. Car. Yes. Um, the bears in, in Yosemite actually select for minivans to break into um, in that national park because, you know, kids, right? Um, minivans have a higher density of food in them than other vans. Uh, so they actually published a paper on it. <laughs> I was reading it and I was like, really? <laughs> Again, they're too smart. Um, but yeah, they can open door handles, um, br break in if they need to. Um, it, there's, the motivation is high, right? Um, when the food is easy and in high calories. So, so safety concerns, right? Um, these are the big questions that we get asked, uh, cats, dogs, people, kids. Um, and uh, cats, I cannot emphasize enough, if you wanna keep your cat safe, please keep it inside. Um, that is the best thing that you can do for your cat. Um, dogs, keeping them on a leash or um, supervised when they're outside during high conflict times of the year. Um, if you have small dogs and you see a coyote, make sure you pick them up um, to, you know, eliminate the temptation. Um, but typically anything that's bigger than like 10 pounds is outside of a coyote's like, it's way too much effort, okay? So the chihuahuas and stuff. Um, we had, which are wonderful dogs, There's no judgment. Um, I, have, I have, yeah. Uh, um, we had in Florida, we had coyotes that were um, picking them off for tractable leashes. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's not good. Um, that's bad for everybody, right? Um, but, and then carrying a noisemaker with you, um, for those of you that walk here in bear country, carrying bear spray with you, I can't emphasize that enough mm -hmm. either. Um, but that works, that works real. I, care, I like carrying bear spray when I hike because of feral dogs because um, I would be more scared of them than I am a bear, but it doesn't hurt to have it regardless. Um, so if you go to the next one. Um, and then again, um, for human safety, an air horn, bear spray, bear spray, bear spray, bear spray. It works on everything. It works on people. I like carrying in Atlanta for that reason as well. Um, it is listed as a weapon in the state of Alaska, by the way. Um, so it's classified as a weapon because there have been so many instances of humans using it against humans. Um, but in, in, regardless of a coyote or a bear, you want to do, don't turn your back, don't run, make yourself the bigger animal. Um, it's important to remember that they work on a dominant system, um, and, and uh, you want to be the dominant animal in that situation. Um, and you don't need to play that bear spray video. Ah, uh, I don't hit that. Yeah, hit that little arrow down there at the bottom. Uh, yeah. Yep. And it. Nope. All right. One more time. There we go. Okay. Injured orphaned animals. Um. So something that I like to point out to people is rehabilitators only have so much space. Um. So if you are going to rescue something, and I use that term loosely, um, make sure it actually needs your help. Um. So leave it there for 24 to 48 hours, fawns included. Um, and if mom still hasn't come and come back, then yeah, you can inter intervene. Um, but if rehabbers fill up with fawns the first week of June, Caitlin has to come out and euthanize the fawns that don't have a home. Caitlin doesn't want to do that um, because look at them, right? Um, so I try and emphasize to people, make sure like there needs to be a dead deer next to the fawn for it to be an orphan. Um, or it needs to have been this in the same spot for 48 hours with no adult care. Um, and then baby birds, lots of baby birds fledge before they're quite ready to fly. Parents will still come down and feed them. Um, so watch for that parental care to happen before you do anything. Yes. Um, so the Audubon has a really great flow chart for baby birds. If you find one, what to do. Um, and they will post this every spring if you follow Georgia Audubon on Facebook. Um, and you can, it will help you decide whether or not you, that bird needs your help. So, um, so I'll go through these quickly um, and, and kind of point out the ones that are um, 
most relevant to y'all. And uh, rabies obviously um, can get into any mammal. Um, possum's normal resting body temperature is too low for the rabies virus to exist. So the possum would literally have to have a fever and get bit by a rabid animal in order to get rabies. Um, so in general, we say possums don't carry rabies because it would be a very, very extreme scenario. Um, and so I like to point that out to people because possums are, some people think that possums are ugly and they hiss and they don't like them and they're greasy. Um, I think that they're awesome. Um, but yeah, um, so that's important to know just in case you do see a possum out, um, it's not rabid. Uh, canine distemper can be uh, transmitted to pets. Um, that's one that you can get your pets vaccinated for, so you should do that. Um, looks very similar to rabies. We actually probably have more distemper than rabies cases when we get phone calls about an animal acting odd. So, sarcoptic mange, we've had two bears in Georgia um, diagnosed with this. Um, and so uh, that can get transmitted to pets. Um, it's a simple treatment with um, two doses of ivermectin um, across the span of two weeks. Um, we don't do that to wild animals. So if you see a mangy fox or a mangy coyote, or um, if you see a mangy bear, please call us because we do want to know about those. Um, there's really nothing we can do for them. It's, you know, we're going to just let them do what they need to do um, and, and let nature take its course on those. If it's like sarcoptic to the point where it's not moving, we can come out and euthanize it. Um, but we don't treat wild animals for the sole reason that we have to get them to a bait pile regularly. That individual uh, administer the ivermectin through a meatball, for example. And then two weeks later, we have to get that individual to come back to that same bait pile and give it to them. And then, okay, now Fox, be wild again. Pretend this food source wasn't here. That's not gonna happen. Um, and so it's better for the population as a whole to just not have that interference by us. Uh, parvo, again, you can, it transmits to, it's from raccoons, there's lots of raccoon pictures in this. Um, but it can go to your pets. Um, so that's another one you can get your, your dogs vaccinated for. Raccoon roundworm, um, pets and people, um, but there's only been 25 cases ever in humans. Um, so really not one to worry about too much. Dogs, yes. Um, and you can um, pretty much like, if you see a raccoon that's greasy looking, um, it probably has raccoon roundworm. Leptospirosis, this is one that not a lot of people get their dogs vaccinated for. If you guys hike with your dogs and they drink out of streams, I absolutely recommend that you get that vaccine for them um, because that's how they get it. A uh, raccoon pees in the water, the dog drinks the water, and then they get lepto. Um, and so again, if there's a vaccine available, and I'm not a pharmaceutical rep for a veterinary clinic, um, but uh, that is, it's important. We had one of our employees, um, his dog almost died from lepto because he didn't get the vaccine. So didn't know it existed. Um, chronic wasting disease, it is not deer zombie disease as the media has um, politely named it. Um, they put that out like right before COVID hit, like that article came out and then, you know, COVID happened in uh, China. Um, and I was just like, oh my God, people are gonna think the deer had COVID first. Um, but anyway, it's similar to mad cow disease, um, except right now we don't, it doesn't, we can't say that it transfers to people. Um, we have no evidence that says it'll go up the food chain through um, to people. But um, it is uh, a severe gradual decline in body condition. This is a deer in Cobb County that we got a phone call about and we were there in an hour because that is a deer that looks like it has CWD. We do not have CWD in the state of Georgia. Um, Alabama and Louisiana just went positive um, and Tennessee, West Tennessee has it. Um, so it's Keeping closer to us, um, and it is something that we're absolutely monitoring for and sampling rigor rigorous, rigorously um, during hunting season. We're taking CWD samples and sending them off to the lab. Um, hemorrhagic disease is one that has plagued the mountains. Um, you guys had a big outbreak of it several years ago, um, <clears throat> and uh, blue tongue and cows similar. Um, they, it's sent, it's uh, distributed by midges. Um, basically, the deer are bleeding out internally. Um, and so they seek out water because they're hot. So if you see a dead deer near water, <clears throat> we want to know about that, or sick deer near water um, in the late summer. So August, September is kind of when we see that peak. If we're going to have an outbreak, it's going to be in those months. 
Um, <clears throat> and so I'll, I'll do this quickly, but um, we typically go out for injured, trapped wildlife. Um, deer are really, um, really dumb. Um, and I know that everybody loves them because they have cute doe eyes, literally. Um, <clears throat> but they get into so many situations in Atlanta. Uh, deer in a poo pond, um, that's one of many that happen um, regularly. Uh, at what we typically don't go to. If you trap an animal by yourself, if you want to DIY trap that raccoon out of your attic, go for it. Do not call me when the raccoon gets trapped because you don't know what to do with it. Um, uh, we don't go to those. Um, mobile injured animals, so like I was talking about the mangy foxes, um, if it's mobile and can move off, we're, by the time we get there, it's not going to be there. So, um, you know, if it becomes, if it worsens, we'll go out and we'll euthanize it, um, but only if it's going to most likely be there. So. Um, we can skip through a lot of these because we already, so sightings, we don't do domestic animals. Um, uh, I know you guys, uh, what's the... No, who's the next, who's your neighbor? Big the canoe. Big Canoe, thank you. They had hogs. Um, I don't know why, I can't remember. I want to call them Bear Creek so bad, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, but, um, but I know they've had hogs, um, so if you guys end up with hogs, don't hesitate to call us. We'll help you work through that. Um, wildlife Services, USDA Wildlife Services is the main point of contact for feral hog issues in Georgia. Um, again, injured orphaned animals. Um, this is a great example of being a little bit into in, ingenious, right? That owl fell out of a nest. Somebody put it in a laundry basket with some, um, you know, uh, leaves and pine straw and a little protective cover so that um, nothing could get to it except mom. And mom came and, and was feeding it. So, um, sick mobile. Ew, click. I get ahead of myself. I apologize. Um, Injured wildlife, um, we typically euthanize everything that we get just because um, there's just not enough help to rehab. And, and a lot of the animals are just beyond rehabbing and releasable. The only thing that we don't do are bald eagles because they're our special snowflake bird. Um, they have to go to a rehabilitator and a veterinarian for examination because they're our um, federal emblem. Sick wildlife, um, bat and house, we always try and go out or get animal control to go out and, and test. Um, bats have a really low prevalence of rabies, but it, if they bite you in the middle of the night and you don't know, rabies is 100% fatal in people um, in, in anything. Um, and so we want to make sure that that person's getting post-exposure shots if they need to. Habituated wildlife, here's your turkeys. <laughs> so these, these wonderful people, um, Accidentally ran over a turkey nest, happens, right? Um, and they, they're not all of them, not all of the eggs uh, were damaged. And so they took their eggs and incubated them in their chicken egg incubator uh, and then raised them. And we're like, well, now they're just like wandering in the streets and aren't afraid of people. And I was like, I'm shocked. Um, <laughs> so those turkeys live at Dossett Trails now. Um, but we had that deer with a collar on its neck, that deer with a um, leash. Um, and that deer was a turd. Um, he tried to get us. As soon as we got out of the car, he went straight for Kevin um, and like put his head down like he was going to buck him. Um, and so we can't do anything except euthanize animals like that. And I hate that, right, because it's not the animal's fault. Um, but we can't have wildlife that's completely unafraid of people. Um, so it's not the animal's fault. It's for sure the person's fault. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a lot of choices. So this is the hawk that um, built a nest over <laughs> the doorway. Um, so, um, we, and we also have a barred owl right now in Buckhead that's um, dive bombing people. It's hit 40 people so far <laughs> in a one square block area. Yeah, um, including us, like, because we tried to simulate the swooping that's happening and it swooped us three times. It just kept doing it. Um, so that's a bad, that's a bad owl. Um, so trapped wildlife, like I said, um, deer, bless their hearts. Um, they get into all sorts of situations. And then big birds getting into netting. Um, that pileated woodpecker was stuck in a screened-in porch. A copperhead in some landscape netting. Um, Shane was brave enough to get him out unharmed. So both, both him and the snake. Um, <laughs> he told me after he did that, I was like, that's probably one that we need to like, you know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure OSHA does not approve. <laughs> uh, so owl in a basement. Um, 
You can, there's, yeah. What, how much time do I have? Oh. We wear GoPros all the time because, you know, we do fun things like this. And I'm an amateur video editor, so I apologize. So that owl actually fell in this guy's old wood stove chimney that he hadn't actually enclosed, he thought he had. Um, and so the guy went down to do laundry in the basement and the owl swooped him and he like totally, <laughs> uh, but there he goes. Off he goes, yay. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I always end the, the PowerPoint like with these videos, right? <laughs> I'm not a monster, I swear. Um, so this is something um, very much not related to y'all, but to be aware of, for those of you that have friends in Atlanta still, please get them to take down their wrought iron fences. That is the second cause of death for deer in Atlanta um, behind vehicles. Um, but these are from 2020, um, 52 different spots where deer have gotten hung up on a wrought iron fence. Um, and they'll go through them, right? Um, that's Shane and Matt pulling the deer out um, but they'll get their hips stuck because they don't understand that their hips are bigger than their shoulders. Um, and, and, but most of the time, if they're caught on a wrought iron fence, it's, it's nothing we can do for them. So um, this is what, why. Why would anybody leave this gap in their chain link fence? But you can go ahead and play it. It's going to be <laughs> loud. Sorry. Um, it's all right. Is that the deer it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We obviously right. talk to the animals like they can hear us, understand us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh, oh, we can skip this one. As much fun as it is, they they lull this goose in with. Uh, so it had a hook on them, but uh, so that one had a hook on it. There's, I mean, it's just, it's an endless number of videos. I could have just like put them on play and not talked at all. <laughs> I might do that next time. <laughs> um, but there's lots of um, opportunities for us to do outreach. Obviously I'm way outside of my normal range, um, but always happy to come and talk to folks about wildlife. Um, we do lots of um, programs like at Fern Bank and stuff. Um, where we, we bring our biofacts and talk about animals. Um, and then the other thing that we have for folks um, is for, we have loaner equipment. So we have signs that say coyote in area. So for area neighborhoods that are experiencing like a high coyote activity, we can put those big, they're big A-frame signs, they're bigger than that, um, out um, somewhere in the common area so that people know that there's coyotes active um, with some literature so that they can you know, learn how to live with coyotes or live with bears. Um, and then we've got loner critter getters and water scarecrows. Um, but for more information, you can go to georgiawildlife.com. Yes, ma'am. What are water scarecrows? Water scarecrows are those motion activated sprinklers. Um, oh. That's their trademark name. Um, so water, but I, they're like 40 bucks on Amazon. I, they're just like the best thing ever. Um, <laughs> Uh, I really, I, we really like recommending those to people. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say, you know, it's almost Easter time, and last year somebody had got little ducks from the practice supply, and then when they got a little bit bigger, they put them at the dam, yes. and then uh, we had to go trap them, and Robert and I took them to a duck refuge above Blue Ridge. Do not go to practice supply and mine, buy those cute little chickens and ducks when you live in Ventry. That, that's not a or bunnies. Don't buy baby bunnies either. We actually, um, at one of the diseases that I didn't list is rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which we've had two positive um, cases for in Georgia. They've all been in domestic bunnies, so not our wild rabbits. But we do have a very vulnerable population of Appalachian cottontails up here. Um, maybe not quite this far south, but um, that we would be worried about if we had a wild outbreak of um, rabbit hemorrhagic disease. So any wild rabbit that you see that um, died suspiciously, so it's not obviously got picked up by a hawk and dropped or hit by a car. Um, call us because we want to get it tested. Um, so lots of lots of fun diseases. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Well, thank you, Katie. You're welcome.